thank you everyone for joining us today. You're here at the uh, at a webinar on nature visuals and thank you for joining us as live or indeed um, on catch up if you're watching this via social media. We are also running the Zoom live transcript function. So if you'd like to view these subtitles, click on the live transcription bar at the bottom of your, your Zoom app and click show subtitles. Um, and there's also the option of viewing the full transcripts which show in your sidebar. My name is Toby Smith. I'm the program lead for Climate Visuals, which is part of Climate Outreach. And, and we're the authors of the, the report, Nature Visuals, Diversity in Images of England's Green and Natural Spaces, that forms the basis of this webinar. Um, I'll be your host for the day. And we've also invited three, three speakers to, to get us underway. Um, and first, I'd like to welcome uh, Amanda Craig, Director of People and Nature from England. And then after Amanda, we'll be hearing from Judy Ling Wong. Judy is a painter, a poet, an environmentalist, and expert advisor on multicultural environmental participation. But Judy's probably best known as the honorary president of the Black Environment Network. And then our third speaker, Joanne Coates. Uh, Joanne is a working class documentary storyteller who uses the medium of photography. Based in the north of England, Jo is interested in modes of production, rurality, working life, and inequality. I will then be joined by Amira Saras, Director of Programs and Research here at Climate Outreach. Amira and I will be presenting six nature visuals principles, chock full of some fantastic photography examples and insights from our research. This webinar is being recorded and we would love your participation and expressions of curiosity with us and each other. Firstly, you can find the chat bar and we'd encourage you to use this in an inclusive and welcoming way to us and other participants. We'd love you to foster connections in the room as best we can, or if you're watching this on catch up, there's the comments bar or on social media. We're going to be using the hashtag nature visuals. There's also a separate Q&A function, which is where we'll invite your questions for any of the panelists for the final 15 to 20 minutes, and we hope to be wrapped up within the hour. And behind the scenes, if you need any help, Kate and Nuri are in the chat bar, do just drop them a message. And finally, when you leave our webinar, there's opportunity for a feedback survey. It's such a vital component in shaping our future work for your benefit. So now, Amanda, if you're with us, um, over to you to, to open this webinar. Thank you. Thanks very much, Toby. And good afternoon to everyone. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Natural England, we're the government's advisor for the natural environment in England, and we've got responsibility for advising on farming, fisheries, landscapes, special places, parks and green spaces, uh, and sustainable development. But also one of our key pieces of work is around Amanda, um, sorry to interrupt. Would you, would you, are you able to unmute your video? We, we can't see you at the moment. I can do that now. Yeah, Excellent. I think Thank you very much. Like that. That brilliant. Thank you. So just to say that one of our key pieces of work is also around connecting people with nature and the importance and benefits of nature in people's lives. So it's concerned very much with understanding and tackling the barriers to nature that people and communities may face. And when we had a look at the photographs and images that Natural England uses in our work, we realised we had very few that showed people. So we were keen to have a look at this to really help us illustrate how people benefit from the natural environment, but also the wide range of things that people from all backgrounds do to connect with nature. This is really important actually to, to really help people see the relevance of the natural environment to their everyday lives but also to help us really better understand some of the barriers as well. Something that we've seen very much strongly communicated so much of during the, the COVID pandemic. So we commissioned Climate Outreach, recognising their particular expertise in, in climate communications to help us create some evidence-led guidance on developing our future images to help appeal to, to wider ranging audiences. This has led to the development of a set of recommendations and a set of principles to help us. And what we really wanted to do was to be able to share this learning with a broader audience, because we do hope it will be of use to others, particularly those working across the environment sector as well. So I just wanted to say thank you ever so much for joining this session today. Um, and a particular thanks for hosting this by Climate Outreach. We're very much on a journey as, as an organisation 
and we know that others are too. So it's really great to have this opportunity today to share what we have learned so far around the use of images. Thank you very much, Toby. Thanks, Amanda. Um, Judy, over to you. Hello, I seem to be unable to turn on my video. Is there something on your end? Let me just check. Um, there you are. We Done. can see you, Judy. Good. You're, you're live. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you all. I welcome the report. It is exciting to see the recognition of the necessity for visuals that move to us consciously incorporating the presence of people representing how the diverse range of people connect with, enjoy and benefit from nature, moving us away from the image of an outdoors for white people with its restricted range of activities. Nature visuals aim to encompass both the rural and urban settings. I will always remember the impact of a trip for a small group of young people living in Birmingham. They were typical of many people trapped within the barren environments of inner cities. They had never seen wild open spaces, mountains or waterfalls, or walked within woodlands or forests. The young worker said to us, after coming home, they just went on and on about how they longed for more green where they lived. The youth organization did various projects, including planting trees in small areas of land identified with the help of supportive local environmental organizations. This was the story that struck me. Before I went into the countryside, the tree in the pavement was just a tree in the pavement. But after we came back, every time I see a tree in the pavement, it brings me the feel and the smell of the forest, the forest walk and the endless green of the countryside. It's obvious that the experience of nature at large is fundamentally transformative and puts all contact with nature into perspective. The process of engagement can be summed up in two short phrases. We love what we enjoy and we protect what we love. It is obvious that access kickstarts this process of enjoyment, leading to the love of nature and the motivation to protect it. This report sets a standard for a more inclusive, contemporary, people-centered visual language. Telling a fuller story of people and nature will ultimately release a vast missing contribution from the social groups that are excluded. I look forward to more images. I would like to see nature visuals showing a great range of activities. Perhaps a Filipino family group sitting quietly under a tree drawing with crayons in their local park. A Latin American group sprinkling water to the four directions as an offering before going on a trail. Or even video clips too of Asian groups discussing how the qualities of reeds are different from those in their country of heritage, comparing basket weaving techniques in the city fringe wetland, or a black gospel group singing in praise of creation as they walk and enjoy nature in the countryside. Seeing people like ourselves participating in the full range of activities in the natural environment builds our sense of belonging, of being full citizens. This report is poised to move us forward with the clarity and simplicity of six principles. Within these principles and the accompanying practical recommendations, we hear the voices that represents the needs, the wishes and the aspirations of target groups. Use images to tell positive, identifiable stories. Create authentic representation, not tokenism. Depict diverse activities in diverse landscapes. Connect people to the wonderful diversity of natural places. Include more real people in images. Diversify who is behind the camera. 
and the message. Importantly, this report gives weight to the need for action. It is something to wave at other policymakers, especially those at the organizational level where implementation needs to take place to transform the inclusion space. The content of the report is not new. It is information that has come through from societal groups at the edges into the center. But significantly, it is an indicator that the theme of nature visuals has arrived at being given the status that it deserves. It is a marker of progress, a marker of shared understanding that has gathered force over time. A benchmark is being set by this report. Even as there is a forthcoming challenge for implementation, we must not sight of the feel-good factor. This is a moment for celebration. We look forward to the promotion of the report, the resourcing of actions, and the monitoring of its impact. At the same time, let us maintain a wide vision and be mindful of the shifting socio-cultural political themes that constantly reframe how we see the context of providing for target groups and redefine our purpose and responsibilities. One example is the growing awareness that the people we call disabled are simply who they are. It is us who disable them and stop them from fulfilling their full potential in life if we do not take up the social responsibility to attend to their personal characteristics. Another example, COP26 has focused our minds on the fact that addressing the existential threat of climate change is about worldwide collaboration. This marks a shift which moves working with ethnic minorities center stage, an environmental sector that can work with confidence with the world of diversity within Britain will gain an ease with dealing with different cultures and acquire the intercultural skills needed for international collaboration. Challenges of identity, belonging, attention to specific needs and provision of a level playing field of opportunity are issues for all poor, excluded and disadvantaged groups, in particular for those with named protected characteristics. This report shows clear actions that help to move them away from exclusion because of who they are or what they look or sound like. This report helps us to work towards making the map real for so many that are isolated and excluded. Who we are and what we can achieve depends on how we see ourselves against the enormous pressure of how others see us. Nature Visuals is moving us in the right direction. It is a joy to see the launch of this significant report. Let us look forward to meeting the challenges positively together, including the proposal of a collaborative and evidence-based image library with input from the community to catalyze new networks and capacity building, as well as developing impactful visual content. This is a fine beginning to a journey to prompt new and continued action in the inclusion space, supported by research, image, production and curation. Thank you for listening. Judy, thank you so much and also for your original contributions to the research in uh, our writing phase. Um, we've also got Joanne Coates, a photographer. Um, Joanne, uh, over to you. Hi, um, I'm a photographer, a storyteller and an artist who works with communities. But I'm also working class, I'm disabled and I'm a woman. Um, I'm also from the rural northeast of England um, and based there as well, which makes me an unlikely speaker. Why does it matter? and why does it matter whose stories get told with images? In the creative industries in the UK, there are less than 12% of working class visual artists, including photographers. If we look at other statistics, it's just as shocking. 
Um, in terms of BIPOC, there's less than 4.8% of visual arts, including photographers. Um, and if we kind of look at intersectionality, the numbers are even lesser. So if we were to look at a woman, an LGBTQ plus person, a disabled person, the numbers go down and down. They're, so obviously they're really low percentages and it gives you little hope of what can be done. But there is hope. Um, would you be able to put the intro slide on? Um, so what this is the majority of visuals we see are from white, middle class to upper class. And they, that's the gaze that we kind of see more often than not. It's well known stories are stronger when they're told through the eyes of experience. My work often takes place where I live. Often regional stories are told um, by a more London-centric voice. Uh, my home's between the Northern Pennines, um, an area of natural, of outstanding natural beauty, um, and the Yorkshire Dales National Park. A beautiful area, but one with problems. Uh, low income poverty, lack of housing, and social exclusion. Many stories of this area are pictorial beauty or rural idylls. I'm interested in telling authentic stories about real people. What I've noticed is lacking is diversity of voices of those who are making images and telling stories. We need commissioners as well as photographers who are diverse, those who are disabled. I want to hear their story. Those who are BIPOC, I want to hear their stories. Those who are working class, I want to hear their stories. For me, these are the voices that are missing. The work I do is often commercial and editorial, but there is a big important part of that that is community driven. This often results in using spaces that like public um, public libraries in, uh, in urban spaces, um, a green urban space. It could be a visitor center in a national park, spaces that will bring people together to explore and the reason for this is to explore these spaces from new perspectives. In this way, we can bring groups together and share these spaces. These are spaces for everyone. The project I'm going to talk about today talks about a place in Upper Teesdale. This is a beautiful place, but it's also a place that has um, issues around poverty and again, social exclusion. Um, it's an area where a lot of the young people from there have to leave. Um, and my work was around working with these young people who are from low income backgrounds um, whose stories are not often told in terms of the rural and visuals around the rural. Um, so when thinking about a future for this place and climate visuals, it was really important that we had authentic, authentic images. So what do we need? We need to look at the area so we need to look regionally, again, not just London centric or look at areas kind of grouped together. We need to look specifically at those areas and we need kind of communication with the local people who are from there, but also with the people who visit there and making that those areas are accessible and thinking about what images tell that story. So in the work I'm doing, the young people were taught by me to tell their own stories through photography. With this type of work, the photographer often has an established practice and um, they will often have experience with groups and understand the ethics of working with marginalized groups as well in, as well as having all the reference checks. But it's really important, this type of work gives kind of collaborative images that tell a really important story. And um, the group asked for other groups to engage with, that was one of the things they said they wanted. And in this way, you can bring urban and rural groups together to create a wealth of images. They share skills together. Um, and the people that I worked with were from eight years old to 18 years old. The work is going to be exhibited in outdoor installation in Bali's visitor center. What this will do is allow visitors and people from the area to explore a natural place in a new way. There's going to be a trail that invites exploration. The images all often look at the natural beauty of the place and what the young people identify as important. And a lot of that is around climate visuals and conservation. But they also talk about hard issues like isolation, lack of housing and feeling socially excluded. Both of these are important to me and you can do this in a positive way. 
what this does is it creates a deeper connection, not only between people, but place as well. So when we think about who is behind the camera, we need to be creative. It could be all different types of people. It could be a collaborative project like this. Obviously, I work as a photographer myself, but I think we really need to see a more diverse wealth of people behind cameras. As, ad as adults, we often explore these issues at a later age. However, I think it's really important that climate visual literacy is explored from a young age so that we can really begin to think about diversity. With each project and place, we need to think about who we are missing and how can we work to include them with the visuals and the work that we're doing. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Joanne, Judy um, and Amanda. And just as a reminder, all three of the panellists um, will be available for questions and answers. So if you do have any questions and answers, please put them in the Q&A bar. And also uh, we welcome introductions and participations in the chat bar as well. So next, I'd like to welcome Amira Sawas from Climate Outreach. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. And thank you so much to Judy and Joanne for sharing some incredibly important insights and for all of your work to ensure representation and inclusion in the environment and climate conversation. I know I've personally benefited from it. What images are chosen to represent nature and climate change send signals to an audience about what and who the communicator values. But the available library of images in England and frankly across the world fail to represent the diversity of both natural places in a changing climate and the communities engaging with them. Until today, I've never seen imagery of nature that I felt I could connect with or I felt seen in, to be really honest. So I'm really excited about it. And this is a reflection of a systemic problem across society. And so we're doing our bit to address one area of this through visual storytelling. But of course, the unpacking of systemic inequalities needs to be systemic. And we encourage you to think about what you can do beyond visual imagery as well. We know from climate outreach's research that we need to build a broad based social mandate on climate and environment where everyone across society feels part of the story and knows how to take action. As the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report said just yesterday, we are nowhere near where we need to be in terms of government, business and individual action on climate. We need to catalyse action at all scales and we absolutely can. The evidence shows that people from all walks of life are deeply concerned about climate change and especially through the lens of nature, so this is really important but they don't feel included in the narratives about it. They don't see people they relate to that we call trusted messengers, messengers in our work uh, represented in those narratives. So as a result of these exclusions, they don't feel empowered to take actions in their own lives necessarily. But we know from our research that when you do start to include people and when you connect them in a meaningful way about their values, identity and lived experiences, their agency grows. They start to feel confident to take action and they're more interested in holding institutions accountable. So hope is not lost. Climate Outreach works on a range of programmes, including climate visuals, but also with climate advocates and communicators, with climate scientists, broadcasters and companies and how they can better engage people on issues like climate change and the natural environment. So do please take a look at our website for more information on our different programmes and projects. But coming back specifically to the topic of today, we're going to share insights and principles from a research project between Climate Outreach and Natural England, and this engaged with a wide range of experts, influencers, and outdoors explorers from diverse backgrounds and positionalities on how to improve diversity in visual storytelling on nature. So we really look forward to sharing more about this today. Over to you, Toby. Thanks, Amira. Yes, um, the report and the webinar was constructed as a product of kind of multiple perspectives and, and different research methods. We, we drew on existing literature, existing articles, journalism, grey literature, and also some of the past expertise of climate visuals in constructing principles, but critically that new primary research with stakeholders on this exact topic. Uh, we conducted interviews with both content producers and influencers from across different types of minority groups, and that was also complemented with further interviews and insights with comms professionals, um, mostly from within the kind of nature and non-governmental organisation NGO sector. Those two groups represented the kind of two pillars of our of our of our audience and our research 
audience uh, and who this report is mostly aimed at, but we also hope that it's not exclusive to those audiences and is a reference point is of use. It's open access to anyone and everyone interested in the nature or photography space. We focused our research on England, but we feel it's robust and a solid guide for the whole of British Isles. It was also really interesting during our literature review phase how much good work and how much fantastic both academic work and strong voices and great exemplars were coming out of North America. So although we hope this we hope this is valuable both to the wider community of nature photography from a global perspective, but I think particularly North America and the US, there's relevance there as well. Before we dive in, I just want to share, not from me, but from the whole wider team and everyone to ever to do with this project. Massive gratitude and thanks to everyone who shared those insights, some of them personal and anonymized, some highly professional and well learned, and also those who shared their feedback since the report was released. We hope, as Judy said, this becomes both a benchmark, but also a practical aid for those people kind of working in this field full time, either personally or professionally. So there was, as, as Judy also kind of touched on in her presentation, there's six visual principles that emerge from this res research. These principles are guidelines. They're not hard and fast rules about how to produce content. And for the next 15 minutes, we're gonna head through some of these six principles as a kind of structure with both visual examples and also highlighting key areas from our research, both barriers and problems that we identified and also possible solutions um, and ideas to kind of work around and you know, bring positive change. We've uh, being, you know, nature visuals, we've included a huge amount of examples from uh, photography, photographers and influencers, all with consent from their subjects, and also some permissive examples screen grabbed from Instagram. Um, this in no way could possibly be exhaustive. And we really encourage, uh, especially during, you know, the, the benefits of social media that people tag and work and highlight and show best practice in this area so that we can all learn mutually. Um, also, so many of the images that we're about to present are from Natural England's own photography collection, which was commissioned only last year using the draft of these principles um, as they came out of the research phase. So, Amira, over to you for our first principle. Thanks. So, principle one is use images to tell positive, identifiable stories. Visuals can capture attention, promote interest and really motivate engagement. We should show diverse, identifiable individuals engaged in fulfilling activities in natural spaces. We need to shift society's occasionally mono-ethnic view. This requires new stories, new role models and authentic, inclusive visual representations of England, its landscape, activities and combinations of those things. We need images that transcend traditional stock portraits and idyllic outdoor photographs that the media is saturated with. As a senior campaigner at an environmental organization told us, in the world of instant everything, people don't always know what to think about stuff straight away. That's where the image is important to capture that authenticity. We also highlight learnings from the on the ground efforts of diverse photographers and social media influence influencers from around the world who are doing the work of reframing what it means to be an outdoor engaged person. Visual imagery is critical for capturing awareness, spurring interest and fostering engagement with the outdoors, nature and climate. And this is an awesome picture of an influencer called the Mervinator. Her name is Mirna Valerio. She's a former educator, cross country coach, ultra runner, an obstacle course enthusiast and someone I've actually personally been inspired and followed the blog of over many years. A Public Health England review in 2020 found compelling evidence that natural spaces really matter for our health. Green environments are associated with reduced levels of depression, anxiety, cardiovascular disease and obesity and can enhance quality of life for both children and adults. But for us to be truly successful and also avert such, you know, crises, English outdoor culture and communications must be equitable, diverse and inclusive of people from all walks of life. One of the key issues highlighted in our review of barriers to engaging in outdoor spaces is a culture of exclusion that leaves many groups and individuals out of the traditional narrative of who participates in the outdoors and how. 
So increasing the representation of diverse individuals in the outdoors and telling new, more inclusive stories is vital for changing the cultural narrative and increasing interest among diverse audiences and also representing the fact that they are engaging with nature already. We're just not necessarily seeing it in our sort of mainstream narratives. This core issue of representation in outdoor narratives is echoed by advocates, including in the following quote. Representation matters. It's important to see people you identify with. That's what inspires people. Thanks, Samira. So principle two, create authentic representation, not tokenization. I mean, authenticity, authenticity is a critical foundation for telling an empowering, inclusive story the audiences will connect with. And this principle really resonates strongly with one of our original climate visuals principles from our previous work of showing real people. I cannot stress enough how everyone reading images, even in a short period of time, has such a sense of truth and authenticity uh, with, with regards to how they respond to images. So this is a fantastic and empowered portrait from Natural England's collection. But so much of the uh, other imagery that we often are exposed to on social media or in commercial areas is stock imagery and staged portraits. They might provide a veneer of representation, but they're not empowering and they can backfire. And these, these images can easily be perceived as inauthentic or merely symbolic. And this is what we personally mean by the concept of tokenization and tokenized images. We recognize that authenticity takes investment in procuring or, or obtaining images, and that itself is a challenge for organizations and communicators of, of all scales. But there's different ways of sourcing images that can kind of help you know, move through that obstacle. Producing live social media content, this is an example of us attempting to do that. Commissioning professional or emerging photographers. Creating a, a photographic brief, an opportunity for contributions from volunteers in people's networks. Perhaps proactively licensing existing photography direct from partners or networks, or indeed licensing existing photography from commercial libraries, if you're careful with your search. So there's nuances and, and things that can help people create a successful brief for photography. I'd always advise that as a first step ahead of commissioning or indeed embarking in a search engine. And there's three pillars or three areas which can be combined to kind of feed in. Concept, activity or place, and then people and needing to think about all three of those things at the same time. There's also out there as inspiration and examples, incredibly successful and inspiring images from social media, from authentic, voice, uh, authentic voices. This is a group mostly based in London called Flock Together that are really doing a lot to bring BPOC communities to nature and bird watching in particular. There's also an element of relationship building and connections through social media with content generators that can produce meaningful and mutual opportunities. But these interactions, like the photography itself, have to be authentic. And we have heard stories of people being extractive or purely looking to obtain images to create a veneer of content to, to actually kind of create a false layer of actual what their activities really are. Principle three is depict diverse activities in diverse landscapes. The cultural narrative of outdoor engagement and what it means to enjoy the outdoors is dominated by a narrow subset of landscapes, activities and people. We, we must enhance and expand representation to break through harmful stereotypes, embrace different or new visual narratives of spaces, people and activities. Creating and inspiring more diversity of thought by producing and co-producing and co-creating visuals with people on the ground and focusing on the story is vital. However, without representation in positions of power and visibility, it will be difficult to shift the perception among the diverse population that the outdoors is not for them. And I'm sort of, this is making me think of the chat that's going on um, on the side about, you know, how to ensure authenticity. And I think it's, very important thinking about who are in those position, decision-making positions who may have lived experience and are able to authentically connect in that way. So while this makes it even more vital to use photography to depict the diversity that does exist and put a spotlight on those who are in positions of leadership from diverse backgrounds, without systemic change, such visuals may only serve to gloss over underlying issues and 
as Toby hinted or spoke to before, there is always that risk of kind of performativity coming through. So we definitely need that more systemic approach. So principle four is connecting people to the wonderful diversity of natural places spanning from urban parks to national landscapes. So the reality is certainly in England that the vast majority of people live in towns and cities. And Natural England's own research concludes that most outdoor experiences occur in urban green spaces, which can often also be informal brownfield sites or might not actually be kind of categorized or defined as being natural or green spaces. Yet the most common, common and most available imagery of England's natural spaces focuses on the countryside, rural environments or, or areas of natural beauty. It's really important we increase the visual representation of these urban green spaces, but also the diversity and the variety of activities that happens there. It's not just about showing the far away, the special, the designated landscapes, which are still important for people in their well-being, but they actually can be largely inaccessible to a large percentage of England and UK's population. So it could be gardening, walking an urban avenue, a day trip to a city park. And again, we don't want to exclude national parks or, or beautiful places. They're important, but we then need to make sure that we show people within them and the full gamut of things that occur there as well. And this will help us make the connections about how people actually really enjoy nature in a range of places in more of an everyday context. But in saying this, we can't forget and must acknowledge there are real and lived concerns about harassment, discrimination, violence, or people simply feeling out of place. This is a repeated theme that emerged in our review and also reared recently in the national media. Imagery alone can't fix these major systemic changes. I think it's worthwhile thinking of the limit. I'm an advocate of the power of photography and visual imagery, but recognizing it has limitations on what it can achieve. And one of those things I'm sure it can do is make the outdoors feel more welcoming and a larger scale in communications. So principle five is to include more real people in images. We know from evidence that this helps people to feel more connected. So images of idyllic, beautiful countryside and wildlife tend to dominate the visual story, while only partially representing the many reasons people actually enjoy the outdoors. And like Toby was just saying about national parks, we're not saying those, you know, they should not be represented, wildlife should not be represented, of course it should, but we do need to see people so that people feel connected and they can see themselves in that story. So people's outdoor and landscape preferences are diverse. They're just as diverse and unique as the people themselves, but we're not seeing that. And as you can see through these photographs, like they're very inspirational. And they, I personally feel really engaged every time I see them and I've seen them many times. So this is just an indication of the difference it can make. So we need to broaden the visual narrative and connect natural spaces to people's everyday lives by showing the many ways they can use outdoors to connect with themselves with their friends and with their family. And this photo is actually a stock photo. It's a really high quality one that just really hits the mark. And it's shot by a female Muslim photographer. Um, so it's not that stock photos can't be great and engaging. And we just wanted to sort of put this out there as an example of when, when they can. And here's a quote from an outdoor explorer uh, from the research work that we did. The quote is, I think imagery is probably more important than the written word. It's just about, it's about just being one of the many diverse faces out there and showcasing it so others can see that actually there's a space for me. That person looks like me. That person comes from where I come from. That person has some shared experiences with me. And while we focus on the visual narrative, we recognize the need to address the structural barriers at the heart of the problem and stress the necessity of other forms of action around inclusion. We can't underscore that enough, which is why we keep repeating it. Focusing only on cultural narratives and visual framing around inclusion without wider structural change is ultimately insufficient. So the final principle, number six, diversify who is behind the camera and the message. Improving the who, what and where of outdoor photography imagery is only one part of the solution. Diversifying who is behind the camera and also designing 
their brief and the wider communications will definitely ensure greater empowerment and authentic visual choices. It's a sad reality that photography globally is dominated by white male photographers. And with that comes inherent issues with an imbalance of power and also issues around the gaze. In our review, this consistently came out as the most important principle to diversify who's behind the camera, which can now, and you know, we wanna try and also highlight um, the diverse group of individuals that are already hard at work harnessing the power of social media to shift the outdoor narrative by documenting their own stories and experiences in ways that fit some of the principles of a report. And these are fantastic people out there in England just doing this work. We, we can, there is, but there are ways in which we could be more collaborative. We can work and learn from these individuals to create new visuals. An example here is Oliver Hellowell is an amazing nature photographer who just so happens to have Down syndrome as part of his identity. However, a lack of staff diversity means that organizations may not be aware of, let alone capable of knowing how to address foundational issues in communities when it comes to outreach. So the tools are out there, but there's occasionally this, this disconnect. And this applies to issues of disability as equally as it does to issues around ethnic diversity. The absence of role models in positions of influence further reduces the visibility of non-traditional members of the environmental community, which can sadly reinforce the perception of exclusivity. And alongside these, these organizational observations, we also saw an important gap in the research when we were putting this report together that must, we hope, be addressed by other organizations, scholars, and also activists. And that's to ensure that we cover all issues of diversity, including non-visible aspects such as class or neurodiversity. This is a specific area where we acknowledge that our own report could have done better. And as for the future, well, we've considered here what would represent the best impact or next steps visually, but what are, well, you know, what are the other avenues that we could explore? Is it testing images, you know, testing images that we do have that we can find, testing them with some academic rigor on audiences to work out which specific content works? Or is it more urgent? You know, as Judy mentioned, can we catalyze some form of library to source more images? Images of what and, and owned by whom? Perhaps that could be a community owned model with equitable access, more municipal rather than commercial. But on that note, um, I'd love to, to end this formal part of the presentation and revert to some questions from our live attendees. So I'd like to invite all the panelists to um, put their cameras back on. And also Nuri, over to you. How is the, um, the question bar working out? Thanks very much, Toby. Um, yeah, I wanted to start with a question that, that Miranda put in the chat and to, to all the panelists, which was, how, what do we mean by authentic images? How do you approach visual storytelling and representation without resorting to outmoded tropes? And who decides what makes a good image? Um, Miranda goes on to ask, who edits the images as editors are often gatekeepers? And what about the question of, re of remuneration for those who create the images? There's quite a lot in that, but I thought that was a really good question to start with. Would anyone like to give that? answer that? Of course. Okay. I think that when you get an authentic image, it is actually an indication of how good your relationship is with the person you're photographing. Because very often, people feel that the photographer or the photo that, that others will see will indicate some kind of relationship of what is allowed and what is not allowed. So when they feel that they're allowed to be themselves, the image becomes authentic. Whereas if you have somebody who is very critical or you feel that you're in a space where you're not allowed to behave in a certain way, then the image will not be authentic. So building that fundamental relationship with the people we're representing and actually working with is a basic part of actually ending up with authentic images. Thanks, Judy. I'm, I'm, I might leap into the middle part of that question because I'm personally quite obsessed with the concept of media gatekeepers, as in who controls what content uh, what images, whether they're authentic or not, are and how and where 
they're they're distributed. I think it's 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 really important that sometimes that connection about authenticity that Judy mentioned accompanies an image into a campaign, and that the media gatekeeper or whoever's choosing the images has those connections, both to who's producing the content, but often the bit that I think is really lacking that's included in the the original climate visuals principles is to know your audience if who is editing and deciding images has a greater awareness and a connection to who they're publishing images for and how they respond to content then that authenticity and that appropriateness and impact can can follow through and i think one of the opportunities of social media is that it it, it gives um, some way in which editors and people within organizations can understand the preferences and responses of their um, of their audiences. Um, I can see Amira's hand. So Amira, over to you. Thanks. Maybe I can reflect a little bit on my sort of previous experience in the development sector, but also as a Muslim woman, um, you know, you know if an image is inauthentic um, when you're part of a community that, or an individual, you know, an identity group that's so, you know, so-called being uh, photographed and it can be things like you just notice that the, the representation, the person, you can sense a discomfort or they're not in the sort of place or space or mode that is you would normally identify with. And it's very hard to explain. But if you think about kind of in the past imagery on poverty and inequality used to be find a starving baby put them into a room with, you know, looks like the building's falling down and take a picture. Well, we know in the development sector now that that's deeply problematic from a safeguarding perspective, but it's also deeply inauthentic. So I do have to say, I really agree with Judy's perspective on, it's about building, it's a safeguarding approach, actually. It becomes authentic because you're taking into account that person, what they need, and you're treating them as an equal and sort of respecting um, respecting them as a, on a human to human level and I just think that that has not happened enough and, and barely really happened on, on climate imagery until the last few years. Thanks. Fantastic. Did anyone have more thoughts on that or if not we'll, I'll move on to the next question. Um, I would just... Okay. Oh go on. Yeah. I would, yeah, I would just echo Amira's. I think it's about respect um, and having respect for the people that you work with as a photographer um, and really kind of doing the work in terms of talking to them or how you portray them and kind of doing a bit of background research into images. Um, and yeah, again, just looking at how, is, how have they been portrayed in the past, what's missing, even like, you know, having a focus group or something, talking to the people that you need to and thinking about, are they the people who make the images? Because they'll probably be best placed to do it. Thank you. Um, we had a question from Becky who asked, um, I'm interested in the ideas from the panel about how these images are shared and circulated and by whom. How do these photographers, these photographs rather, have a life beyond appearing on, on static websites and contribute to an ongoing conversation in policy and elsewhere in ways that are respectful to the photo's subjects? Whose stories are being told, where, how, and to what end? Um, would anyone like to, to answer that? I can come in first off, Nuri, just with just with a few thoughts around next steps, because it, it, it's certainly an, a, an important next step for us to take after um, the publication of this report. And I'm also interested in a, a collective approach around this as well, because I know there's a number of organisations that are grappling with exactly the same question as well. So it's something that we can certainly have more conversations about. And I think also, um, some of the work that we're going to be looking at, I think, has actually come up through the chat uh, as well, actually, with um, Cordelia Spalding, um, uh, one of Natural England's members of staff, is, is having a look at some of this as well from a public engagement perspective. Um, but also some different ways that some of the, the, the photographs can be used, which is exactly that, that question, which is a brilliant question. Um, for example, are, are there community spaces, for example, that, that some of these um, photographs could be used in show reels and things like that? So there's, there's definitely some really good scope for some, some collective work around uh, where, where, where these images could be used, how we could showcase them and continue to develop them. So, yes. 
think, I think, I think I that we can choose to, to be purposeful in terms of showing images. Like Amanda said, you know, for example, there might be activities that, that minorities are not familiar with, which are offered in the countryside or in city parks or whatever, so that there will be some kind of pioneer image of the first people actually doing the images, doing, doing these activities. And then you need to get their consent to be happy that they're shown and become community images. So it, it, a lot of it is about relationship building and being purposeful. They would like to see the images after you've taken them to see if they prove of can they're happy with it to share with other people but ultimately i think one of the the aspects of images when we talk about community images is that people will also have many images on their own phones of themselves family members community members enjoying themselves that they pass around showing people because they enjoyed themselves so much. So there's a promotional side on official websites and so on by organizations, but there's also the informal side of how people being really pleased with what they had done, sharing these images among themselves. And then if we encourage them, if they become confident and so on, that they might share some of these personal images of enjoyment and so on with the wider community. So there's a lot of negotiation going on to end up with images where we want them, which that will make a difference. I often like thinking about the full life cycle of, of an image. And I think Jo brought it up with her example of her work and, and Judy's touched on it here is that photography is such an amazing tool for participation, you know, right at the beginning, the, the kind of almost the the, the genesis of where a photo is taken even if it doesn't go any further and it's great that it can but it it is that kind of moment uh, in a space and it makes it more more memorable but i'm also i also love photography because it creates really um with consent and with permission and in an authentic way ideally they're kind of really um, flexible units of information and truth and honesty and narrative that can go into lots of different places. Um, I think an example that certainly made us um, proud as a programme with regards to policy was that the Nature Visuals report was uh, proudly being exhibited at the COP26 Leaders Lounge. This wasn't a public exhibition, but it was an influential one at the time. But then also, how can we exhibit and bring some of these images into other elements of, of, of kind of cultural areas, whether that be physical exhibitions or online exhibitions or on social media. And I, I do like the way in which photography um, can be used in these ways. But I think I'm going to end on a, a note of caution from the research that didn't come out uh, in the webinar so far is that there is a, a danger that we can overuse certain amazing images that they get uh, you know, maybe because we don't have enough of them at our disposal as organisations or because they they can become kind of over popular visual metaphors that we reach for to signify something. So in that sense, we need to have kind of um, deep pockets of content, not just one or two amazing images. We need to kind of spread that that value across a collection uh, of images. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we were, we're wrapping up uh, the Q&A in, in one minute, but I was just going to go to a question that uh, was asked by Joe uh, for Joanna, Joanne, sorry, excuse me, um, which was, uh, who said, I really like the idea of seeing people, uh, of the idea of seeing people, of people seeing this diversity of images um, outdoors and on trails. And what new or old ways of sharing diverse images and diverse photographers' representations do you think we should look at? So I would, in terms of this aspect, look at socially engaged photographers. Um, so what that means is that uh, photographers who might not work commercially, so maybe you haven't come across them before, but they work with communities and they will often show works in really interesting ways. Um, for example, the work, the group that I was talking about, we're going to show work um, from trees and it's on kind of mesh material that's breathable and recyclable. Um, and kind of thinking about things like that. But I would also maybe think about those groups, like I'll just post it in the chat. 
Um, so, you know, there's groups that maybe you could think, is there anyone who's interested in photography? Could we send a photographer to work with them so that they could take the photos themselves, but just have someone who was guiding them and teaching them? Um, so, you know, there's all, all different kind of innovative ways to think about how to do that. Um, and if you kind of want to find photographers, I will just post um, a few links. These ones are for black women photographers and women photographers. Um, and you can kind of search by region, um, but they're, they're both worldwide. Um, so that's just a kind of quick way to find photographers who you might want to work with. Um, but I think in terms of what will work outside, you have kind of climate experts, you have people who will know about the area's preservation and it's bringing those groups together with photography and thinking like, what can we do that will make a really big impact and is a bit different. Um, and I think that there's a good scope for those kind of two groups to work together that maybe isn't happening at the moment as well. Amira, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, participatory photography is a really important and exciting kind of area of work. And I've person I'm not a photographer, but I've personally worked in it in the past uh, in other countries around issues to do with landscapes and climate change. And, um, you know, like some of the most powerful images I have ever seen on these topics were generated through participatory photography. And those images have kind of lived and sustained and lasted a really long time. And I just think, yeah, that's that authenticity coming for you through because it's a totally different series of images when the people involved are actually behind the camera compared to a photographer necessarily. So I really support um, Joanne's thinking there around kind of upskilling and giving the opportunity to people to put the camera, to take the camera into their own hands. I think nowadays there are so many community-based people who take wonderful photographs because cameras are now simplified into being a phone and we get fabulous images on them. And I know that from the days of Black Environment Network when we asked groups that, that we funded to go out into the countryside to give us photographs. Of course, they never had professional photographers. It was their worker or somebody who they thought was quite good at it in their community. So that the Im images were authentic because they were part of the group. And I think we can find many people who are part of the community who will produce quite wonderful images if we get enough of them. So I think that that's one of the places we should really explore. Thank you, Judy. Kobe, back to you to close up. Yes, thanks, Nuri. Um, well, firstly, thank you to everybody who I can't see, our live participants, for what's been a great chat bar and questions. Thank you to our panellists and speakers who've joined us on camera. Thank you for the people that shared their images and shot them for this webinar. Um, we There is an opportunity to continue this conversation on social media with the hashtag NatureVisuals or potentially in the comments bar below, if you're watching this on YouTube. I'm gonna end with a note from one of our first interviews we did with this project that the whole team found particularly motivating. Uh, and then we're gonna go back to the holding slide and wish you a good day. Let's get more people from diverse backgrounds into this. We are at the cusp of a climate emergency and no one nation is going to solve this alone. It's something that's gonna take all of us putting our shoulders to the wheel. Thanks again all. Good day.